afternoon. We're, we're excited to talk about the Mazavitica Experimental Forest. Uh, we'll let people roll in here for a second here, and then we'll get starting as we have done in the past. I did want to do our land and knowledge statement that we respectfully acknowledge that the Wabanaki, the people of the Don Land, are the original stewards of the forest we discussed today. Uh, the University of Maine is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. The University Center for Research and Sustainable Forests supports forest research and education in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki tribal nations. We strongly support the inclusion of indigenous science and values in forest leadership, management, and research. Well, thank you everyone for being here and joining us. Um, this is our second of our third year of the Science and Practice webinar series. Uh, we had a great event at Howland Forest for those who could join us in October to kind of talk about the spruce fir ecosystem. Today, we're moving a little bit further south into southwestern uh, Maine uh, to talk about some of the oak pine system and, and a great a long-term experimental forest that the U.S. Forest Service has been involved with for many decades. A lots of exciting interdisciplinary research that's going on at the intersection of, of climate change. So with that, I will turn it over to my co-host, Amanda Mahaffey. I just want to acknowledge Meg Ferguson for all her great work on organizing this series, as well as the, the continued partnership with Logan Johnson at, at Main Tree. Uh, we'll have the webinar. Uh, we'll talk about the field tour near the end of, of today's discussion. So thank you, everyone. Yes, and a huge thanks. We have a long list of speakers. And so, wow, all of you are filling out this poll. And by the way, co-hosts, I don't think you have the ability to complete the poll, so don't worry about it. I'm going to um, steal the mic briefly from Mariko before I turn it over and just list uh, our, our speakers uh, and presenters for today. We are joined today by Mariko Yamasaki from the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station by John Janelle, uh, U.S. Forest Service Region 9 uh, Forest Health Program, and with a lot of fire experience. Thanks for joining us, John Janelle. John Neely, U.S. Forest Service Region 9 White Mountain National Forest. Chuck Lubelczyk from the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. Kevin Dodds, U.S. Forest Service Region 9 Forest Health Program. Isabel Monk, U.S. Forest Service Region 9 Forest Health Program. Also Katie Glover from University of Maine's uh, Climate Change Institute, and myself. So with that, I'm gonna give you a countdown from five to one, and then we're gonna stop the poll. So please complete it. Five, four, three, two, one, bing. So ending the poll, please share the results. I think that was Meg sharing the results. All right, so, so our speakers know where all of you are coming from. Uh, almost three quarters of you are, are zooming in from Maine. Um, about uh, uh, one in five are from the New England region. We have a few folks, folks from outside of New England and a couple of Canadians. So welcome everybody. In terms of the backgrounds that bring us to this meeting, um, we have uh, almost half of us uh, identify as scientists. Um, uh, four out of 10 identify as foresters and, or, and then uh, three out of 10 identify as another kind of natural resource professional. And we have an interested public and we have some others. Now, in terms of familiarity with the Mass Massabesic Experimental Forest, um, a few folks are, are very familiar. Um, almost half are, uh, are familiar with the area, but don't know much about the Massabesic. Um, there And then uh, maybe 22% are not familiar with the forests of Southern Maine or forest management efforts there, um, and others just straight up no. So um, ah, then another question, do you use or think about using prescribed fire or burns in your work? We'll come back to this one. Um, so about half of them, half of all of you uh, want to understand more about the benefits and when it might be most useful. Um, a quarter of you currently use prescribed fire, um, and uh, another 17% uh, have considered burning. So very interesting uh, graphics there. Um, thanks, everybody, for completing the poll. And with that, I will turn it over to Marco, and Meg is going to get ready to share her screen um, for our very, very fast-paced, uh, action-packed <laughs> webinar today. Thanks, Amanda. Um, my name is Mariko Yamasaki, and I'm the scientist in charge of Bartlett Experimental Forest in New Hampshire and Massabesic in Southern Maine. What we're doing today is pulling folks that have been doing work and continue to do work on the experimental forest and just give you a brief overview of what 
what's been happening and where we think we would like to go in the future if the gods are smiling. So John, Janelle, it's all yours. Thanks, Mirko. Um, so like, I, my name is John Janelle. I'm a forester with Region 9 Forest Health and formerly site manager slash forester uh, at the Massabesic for 16 years or so. Next slide, please. So the Massabesic is uh, very unique where it's solely owned by the Northern Research Station. Uh, most experimental forests are within the proclamation boundary of a national forest and they get a lot of uh, support from the national forest system where the Massabesic does not. Uh, it's about 3,700 acres separated into three separate units, a northern unit and a uh, southern unit and an administrative site, which is off of Route 111 in Lyman, Maine. Uh, just for folks uh, who are, you know, really want to do research here, do some work here, you know, there's office space, there's a tiny bit of dirty lab space to do projects, there's a meeting room and such, so it's a very usable facility. Uh, the Massabesic was established between 37 and 42 um, via the Weeks Act as a Eastern White Pine Research Forest. And uh, it was um, land that was purchased through uh, from Bates College because their forestry program went under and a lot of private parcels that the Forest Service purchased. Uh, the forest closed during World War II just so funds could go to the war efforts. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter started up again. Uh, the forest has a lot of just, you know, great recreational opportunities. There's hiking trails, um, you know, there's in the wintertime, there's snowshoeing, snowmobiling, you know, ATVs in the summertime, that sort of thing. So it's very unique where uh, we do have that recreation piece along with a, uh, a working research forest. Uh, some of the forest ecology wildlife that we have is, you know, it's, it's really a, an oak pine forest with hemlock. We do have Atlantic white cedar, um, tons of vernal pools, wetlands. Um, I'm going to steal the wildlife piece of Americo. Uh, there's forest raptors, bobcats, moose, deer. Uh, we have landings, turtles, and uh, quite often you'll run into um, a bobcat way around the forest. Next slide, please. Just a quick map of the of the of the units um, on the southern unit side. You see that small piece in yellow. Um, that is the administrative site. So we, we do share it with the main forest service. And there's uh, some forested areas here as well. Um, we're you know in southern Maine, so I know these photos are a little old. You can't see very well, but um, there is definitely that urban interface piece. A lot of residential areas that. Um, do border the forest, which makes it unique as well. Next slide. So once you know the the forest started up again after the fire uh, after um, the war, fires of forty seven hit um, southern Maine. Um, most of the communities surrounding the Massabesic um, were heavily destroyed or or damaged. Uh, next slide. Massabesic south so. That's like 80, 82 percent of it was burned um, post fire. Four and a half million board feet were salvaged from the forest, and then um, a wind event in 1950 plus Hurricane Carol um, added some increased damage, and another 1.75 million board feet were removed. So, looking at the map, there are a couple areas on the forest that were not damaged during the fires or the wind events. Um, which are pretty unique, but the rest of the forest is is relatively young. So next slide, post fires of 47, we kind of, the forest transitioned to a re big rehabilitation study looking at how we're gonna, um, you know, bring those forest systems back post fire. So there's a lot of plantations, aerial seeding, as you can see from this photograph. Um, there was also a lot of aerial herbicide work to prevent any hardwood regeneration the Forest Service is really looking at keeping this a softwood forest. And um, after that, there was some genetics work. And then the, then the forest, um, unfortunately, kind of went dormant again until uh, Mariko, Yamasaki, and Bill Leak started up in 2007. 
Next slide. And we're on to Marico. Yeah, you want to back up one, Meg, please? Thank you. Um, so, you know, John alluded to a very um, dormant period uh, at the Massabesic, uh, but starting in about 2000, late 2005, we started revving up, trying to rev up the program again. And in we got a very basic forest management plan written. Um, and in 2007, we initiated um, the first timber sale treatments to demonstrate um, a number of different practices and see how um, those practices um, worked with uh, wildlife habitat considerations. So we did four three acre patch cuts in the Northern unit off the chicken farm road or off the, um, the CC road. Um, we did a 12 acre shelter wood that uh, was in one of those areas that John pointed out, um, missed getting burdened in the 47 fire. We had a 22 acre group selection um, treatment at the westerly end of the CC road to look at trying to remove some hemlock and see if we could get some pine and, and uh, oak regeneration and a 90 acre low density thinning off the chicken farm road to, to see if we could uh, moderate the effects of pine decline in the area. Next slide, please. So patches were cut in the uh, fall of 2007. They were whole tree harvested. Um, there were uh, inclusionary trees left in, in several of the of the cuts to try to uh, continue white oak and red oak regeneration. Uh, we wanted to we wanted to regenerate a dense mix of hardwoods and softwoods as well as oak. We used uh, whole tree thin uh, whole tree harvesting as a practice in late fall um, to try and get the scarification that would be inherent in in regeneration. And what we were trying to do was to establish some early successional habitat where very little uh, existed at the time on the Massabesic. Next slide, please. The second, the second treatment was a shelter wood. It was um, also cut in the fall of 2007. Um, basal area varied, but it sort of averaged around 140 square feet. The prescription was to bring it down to about 80 to 100 square feet. Um, from below. We also wanted Cooksbrook is adjacent to this stand and we wanted to make sure that we got the riparian buffers correct on that and be able to uh, maintain the integrity of that um, buffer area. And we expected to create a mix of canopy conditions and regeneration layer habitats. Next slide, please. The group selection harvest was down at the other end of the CC road, um, 22 acres. We wanted to use small groups, 10th to two acres in size. We removed um, a fair amount of dense uh, hemlock midstory to regenerate white pine and northern red oak. Again, expecting to produce small gaps of dense regeneration of oak pine and mixed hardwoods. Next slide, please. And the big one, area-wise, is a 90-acre mechanically whole tree harvested um, area on the chicken farm road that was severely impacted by pine decline. There was a lot of pine dying, a lot of mortality in these stands. Um, so in the fall of 2008, uh, we harvested that. The marking for the stand was rather difficult, trying to find sufficient um, stems to maintain after the cut. So um, there were two levels of density, 32 square feet roughly, and 60 square feet of residual basal area in the, in the units. We were very, very fortunate to have an extraordinarily heavy white pine seed fall um, in the fall of 2008. Site was well scarified with the mechanical operations. And um, you can see some of the 
resulting regeneration. Songbird surveys were started in the second growing season in 2010. Next slide, please. You're on, Katie. All right, thanks, Mariko. Um, everyone, I'm Katie Glover at the Climate Change Institute. I'm a research associate here that is interested in landscape change, especially how vegetation responds to climate and disturbances like wildfire. Um, so this is gonna be a big gear shift. I'll take you back in time to talk a little bit about the history and potential for knowing the longer term history of vegetation change in Southern Maine in this area. Um, I like this map on the left to just talk through a bit of the glacial history. This is by CCI colleagues. Um, the margin of the ice sheet, of course, used to cover most of New England and extend out to the ocean. And Massabesic sits right on this limit where about 14,500 years ago, the ice sheet had retreated and so depressed the continent that the ocean was actually in inland Maine today. So on the right, there's this picture that just shows really a lot of the dynamics and processes that happen when we get this intersection between ice sheet hanging out into the ocean, um, the marine setting here, and then the land. Um, and then a lot of the deposits like till, which is this unsorted mass that can have um, clays in it, silt and clay, um, glacial flour is another favorite of mine that is just this really pulverized ground up clay. And just how that creates this setting where there's really poor drainage and just a lot of places where we can find vernal pools and wetlands and um, small basins where that could provide some insight into the longer term fire and vegetation history. Next slide, please. So this broad overview of what happened after deglaciation and a bit of history of vegetation in Maine, um, we have this exposed landscape that's rocky and pretty barren and gets first colonized by tundra-like plants. That then changes to spruce and poplar. About 11,000 years ago with a warmer, drier climate, there was likely more fire at the time and we start to see this mix of conifers and hardwoods and then beach hemlock forest as it gets moister about 8,000 years ago and a little warmer. And then I've noted two other events down below um, about 5.5 thousand years ago, there's a sudden hemlock decline that we see in the pollen record that we still don't quite know why. A few hypotheses suggest drought or um, insect pathogens. And then about 1500 years ago, hemlock returns, spruce expands again, and we start to get the forests that look like we, what we have today in Maine. Next slide, please. So how does this relate, or how do we know that history? Um, part of my experience, I've taken a lot of lake cores, bog cores for the last 20 years all around North America. And just having this deglaciated landscape, there's a lot of hummocky land and opportunities for there to be ponds, vernal pools, small basins, lakes. As the vegetation comes in, we start to get this pollen deposition that builds successive layers of what's in the environment at the time. Um, and then with either a piston core, this is a Russian core that you spear into the ground and like laterally take a sample, we can capture those successive layers and start to look back and look at how the pine pollen changed. Um, I think these are part of the daisy family, the pollen grains that are shown here. And then concurrently with that, we can count the charcoal grains or what charcoal was in the area that most likely came from fire in the immediate area or really small particles of charcoal that were wind transported. Next slide, please. So back to why the glacial history matters. This is a map of the surficial geology where I've overprinted approximately where the south and north sections of MEF are located. And you can see they are right on that glacial marine limit that I described, that's the blue border or the line that kind of weaves through the left-hand side of the map here. And then in yellow, the two sections approximately of where the forest is. And you can see there's this really heterogeneous set of glacial deposits. There is till, there are lake bottom deposits, eskers, that's basically like a stream of silt that was deposited by meltwater underneath the ice sheet. And so it really creates this poor drainage in the area. Um, and on the next slide, I'll build a little bit on what John Janelle had mentioned about the 
um, abundance of vernal pools in the area. Because the surface geology has these deposits and so much clay that really impedes the drainage. So we get this really high concentration of vernal pools, both at MEF and in this uh, section of Maine in York County. Um, I think I've noted here that it's like 10 times more than other parts of the state. And so potential for paleo work in MEF is what I'm kind of excited about. I see huge potential to take a few cores and start to see what the local history is. You know, I went over the general um, trajectory of how we went from tundra to spruce, et cetera, in Maine. But oftentimes there are these like really hyper local differences. Um, I'd imagine there would even be differences between the south and north if we were to take some vernal pool uh, cores and see exactly what was growing um, around that small basin throughout its history. And the other thing that would be pretty neat is like we have this known fire event that happened in 1947, you know, burned about 80% of MEF. So being able to find something like, like that, like a known historical marker in a sediment core, it gives you this benchmark that lets you then go down, look at other charcoal concentrations, look at other events, and you have kind of a sense where there might have been similar events well before we have instrumental record keeping. Um, so happy to talk more on Friday about what we know about the fire history in Southern Maine from other cores and sites like this. And I'll pass it on to who's next. Hi, Chuck, you're on. Okay, uh, my name is Chuck Lebelzik, and I'm here with my colleague, Molly Meager. Um, and between us, we work on a lot of the field survey and research for our lab at the Maine Health Institute for Research. We have a new name. Um, our work on the massive Bezik has really revolved the last decade or so around doing mosquito surveys as part of a statewide program for doing arbovirus surveillance. Um, a lot of this work is very cooperative. We work very closely with the Maine Department of Agriculture, the Maine Center for Disease Control, as well as the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And a lot of our work was galvanized in 2009, uh, following a very wet spring and early summer, uh, we ended up having um, a small outbreak of Eastern equine encephalitis virus covering several counties in Maine, where uh, several incidents of livestock, uh, primarily horses as well as alpacas, and then also raised pheasant flocks uh, died from the virus. Um, so we now have a, a semi statewide surveillance program, which you can see on this map here, uh, delineating where several different agencies are working on doing mosquito surveys. Uh, our work does concentrate a lot in southern Maine, where we have had a regular history of doing uh, surveys for eastern equine encephalitis virus, but also West Nile virus. And primarily, you know, the, the work on the Massabesic is interesting because if we have a year where Tripoli is going to be found or detected in Maine, um, the MEF is one of those sites that we will count on it to, to show up as a positive. I know America is grimacing right now. I'm sorry for that. We, we have another site over um, in the area in Lebanon, where again, a very large wetland complex um, has also produced uh, regular activity for Tripoli during a year when we have a lot of sufficient rainfall. Uh, next slide. And so with Tripoli, which again is our, our probably our most important mosquito-borne virus, West Nile certainly is around, but it's, it's much milder in, in scope, uh, clinical symptoms, as well as, as frequency. Uh, but Tripoli is, is very dependent on, on specific habitats, uh, such as forests and wetlands, primarily Atlantic white cedar, but also red maple swamps. And, and the mosquitoes that ramp up the virus in nature tend to exist uh, and breed in areas where there's a lot of crypt systems underneath uh, the forested um, trees. So red maples will frequently have crypts that go down several meters in some cases where the mosquitoes may actually be active as a larval state in the wintertime. Uh, and this provides excellent breeding habitat for the mosquitoes to then emerge in the spring. And in general, if we're going out doing survey work, we tend to look for areas where we have a lot of these crypts holding water, uh, especially in February, March, and April. Uh, the water itself should be tea colored, very tannic, uh, with a peaty bottom, very acidic, and you have kind of that sulfur smell that when we do survey work to look for mosquito larvae, uh, if we end up having crypts with um, uh, the mosquitoes we're looking for, generally we'll have kind of that uh, sulfuric smell coming out with the water that we're extracting. Um, and again, you know, we really are looking at this in terms of climate change looking at the idea of having long-term monitoring sites. So we can look at things like precipitation patterns, 
Um, and the precipitation patterns could be summer, it could be going into the fall, and also possibly looking at overwintering conditions as well to see um, if we can determine the effects of climate change um, on these disease vectors. And that's my pitch. Thanks, Chuck. Next slide, please. Kevin, you're on. Hey, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Dodds. I'm a forest entomologist with Forest Health Protection. That's under state and private. And I work out of the Durham, New Hampshire office. Um, most of the work that we've done um, on Massabesic has been related to bark beetles and wood borers, um, really kind of broadly in two categories, um, surveys and then method development projects. And, and our method development projects are just simply really applied science. Um, in terms of surveys, uh, you know, probably for, wow, almost 15 years now, off and on, we've done um, exotic species surveys across the forest looking for um, exotic bark beetles or wood borers. Uh, nothing's really jumped up from those, which is good news. Uh, this last fall, we added uh, southern pine beetle um, traps to two sections of while well, in the southern section in two different forests that have a really small component of pitch pine. And then, you know, probably since 2010 or so off and on, we looked for Cyrex wood wasp either in traps or uh, visual surveys. We also did a trapping study when, and looking at lures and traps for Cyrex and, and never caught that invasive species um, until recently. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The uh, method development work, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how disturbance affects uh, bark beetle and wood borer communities and then, and then how that relates to how we can detect those insects and properly sample those communities. Uh, so we've been able to tie into all of that work that, you know, Mariko and Bill and John did in those units where they thinned. Uh, so we could look at that background disturbance and, and figure out if, you know, maybe those would be good places to survey for um, exotic species or poor choices based on, you know, competition with background volatiles and things like that. So, um, and this all kind of ties into this idea of trying to improve semiochemical baited survey trap methods. These traps go out, you know, all across the, the country, really. And, uh, but there's a lot of like little questions that we don't know about how, how different variables affect trapping success. And so we've been trying to um, knock some of those out over the years too. Um, next slide, please. And so unfortunately we have had some new detections at Massabesic all over the last year, really. Um, I mentioned trapping for Cyrex, having no um, success at that. Um, but this past year, we brought in some logs from a study I'll talk about in a minute. And really one of the first insects that emerged were, was Cyrex noctilio. And that was the first find of Cyrex uh, wood wasp in Maine. So a little bit surprising because not, not in a host that it's overly associated with, with white pine. And then we also found uh, four adult southern pine beetles in one of our traps, uh, probably captured the last week of October or that first week in November. So um, southern pine beetles also, at least in the area, we don't know if it's surviving winters or anything like that yet. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just some uh, examples of the methods work we've done. I, I already touched on that silviculture and insects and disturbance and in insects, but you know we've looked at various factors, uh, trap maintenance. You know we we dump these traps out, uh, don't necessarily clean them during the season, and you get this thick. I mean everybody knows the pollen loads in the spring, and uh, you get this thick layer on the traps, and we were wondering how that effect it catches. We've looked at trap height and how that influences the community you're able to capture. And then, you know, through the last decade or so, lures on traps, the semiochemical lures have gotten really large to a point where um, they're often, at least visually, they seem to be blocking traps. So we wanted to uh, see if that was a factor. So all of these, all of these studies have been published and um, they're available. And if anybody's interested, they can reach out to me. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, this is, we'll talk about this a little bit more on Friday for uh, people who are on the tour, but right now we have a pretty large um, emergence project going on at Massabesic and, and Bartlett Experimental Forest. And I feel very fortunate to be able to do them there. Uh, this is a long-term study. It's something we've thought about for a long time. And really the goal here is to, um, 
you know, look at every tree species in a stand, uh, set up replicates of those, cut them down, uh, set up uh, trap logs essentially, and then bring those trap logs in for rearing over a three year period. So we'd have all of the tree species in that forest represented it. We would know what insects were coming out of all those trees, sort of combine that together to define the community present in the forest and then compare that to traps because right now we have no idea how, how efficient or how effective uh, traps are really documenting a community. And so this would give us some insight into maybe, you know, detection possibilities for exotic species and things like that. So pretty big project and, and you'll see some of it on Friday uh, for those of you who, who are coming to the tour. So I think that's it. I think we go to Isabel next, maybe. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, Isabel. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Kevin, I work for State and Private for service in the Durham Field Office, and I'm a pathologist, so I'm interested in diseases. I'm interested in, in the management of diseases and in forest settings, really like silviculture is really the only economically feasible way to manage diseases. So um, we have, oh, I am I able to turn, sorry about that. Hopefully my camera is on now, but um, basically um, the the massive at the Massabesic, uh, we've had um, I started work there to look at this disease of hemlock called Suricaca shoot blight because um, hemlock is getting impacted negatively by exotics such as hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale, and there's been a lot of focus on hemlock health, so. Um, in, in maybe like 2010, 2011, this disease was described for the first time in Maine, and we didn't know anything about its biology. Something similar had been described in British Columbia, in Alaska, um, affecting Western hemlock, but we had no information about this disease in the East, and we suspect that it's something that's been here, but it's been overlooked, and we've had um, permanent plots where we've looked at how it's affecting regen. And basically it looks like it's killing about a third of the new shoots in areas where it's um, present and it's present pretty much throughout New England and it fluctuates from year to year. Some years it's worse than others. But um, as a result of this work on hemlock, we, you know, I started looking, you know, we didn't, we did a like a bigger survey beyond the Massabesic and we were looking not just the Suricaucus, but other, dis, you know, like everything that was affecting region, including hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale. And it turns out that um, UV light is supposed to be bad for hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale. It negatively impacts them, the populations. And also, um, the same pattern is, is is observed for the Saracaca shoot blight. So we have, um, you know, I've been working with John Janelle to uh, release. In addition to that, there's not been a lot of information about managing hemlock silviculturally. So I've been working with John Janelle to identify um, places where region hemlock region is established at the Massabesic and to release that region through different treatments. And next slide, please. Um, such as shelter wood groups, and then like the no treatment control where um, these treatments will take place hopefully next year. And the region that's present there will be released. And then we'll evaluate the is different insects and diseases uh, present in the in the hemlock region, and we've already done pre-treatment data collection where we've assessed the status of the region before the treatments, and we're hoping that by opening up the stand, increasing the light intensity, some of these um, insect and disease pests will be diminished. And I'm not we're not going to see this on Friday, but I we've done something similar with. Uh, white pine, looking at insects and diseases of white pine in the same stands that Marico worked on for songbird surveys. So with that, that's it for me. Thank you, Isabel. You have the next slide, please. John Neely, you're on. Yes, hello, everybody. Good morning. 
Um, my name is John Neely. I'm an assistant fire management officer on the White Mountain National Forest. So I'm involved in um, fuels, fire reduction, fire suppression. Um, I'm also very interested in <clears throat> fire ecology and fire history in the Northeast. Um, and I've noticed um, in our area, there's not a great deal of research into any of the things that I'm interested in. Uh, and what we're seeing with these um, predictions of our changing climate, uh, I think we have potential to start to see uh, larger fires in our future in areas that were in the past resistant to fire establishment and fire spread, um, including things like our uh, northern hardwoods, our birch, beech, maple forests that typically uh, are moist and shaded um, and resistant to fire. Uh, it's just possible that as our temperatures increase, our snowpack decreases, um, we see more short-term droughts. We see more insects and disease moving into these stands. Uh, they may become more available to burn. Um, and so that's something that I think would be useful to look at and think about. And Massabesic is an excellent area to look at some of the questions that fire and fuels managers have. Um, and I've got some photos of some recent fire <clears throat> fires that we've had. Um, the one, uh, the 105 acre one we had this spring uh, was directly impacted by a spongy moth defoliation that um, allowed the fuel beds to be much more receptive than they typically would. And the, those, um, you know, those fires spread fairly rapidly. The 314 acre one in the lower left was uh, just um, a little ways off from the Massabesic in um, some pine oak stands. And the 72 acre one was a spruce fir fire that we had in 2017, where we saw very rapid crowning fire behavior, uh, very active fire at night. Um, and uh, you know, represented all of these represent some control. They were they were difficult to control um, during that initial attack. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some of the reasons why I think Massabesic is a really good place. Um, there are experimental forests across the country that have really, uh, for years been focused on fire and um, fuels research. There's been a lot of them that have been established out in the Western US for a long time. The Central Hardwoods, uh, Ohio, West Virginia have some that have um, for years been concentrating on fire and fuels research. And uh, the Silas Little in New Jersey uh, has also been looking at fire and fuels in the pitch pine scrub oak stands down there. But there really isn't a forest with uh, representative stands of our northeastern forest types. Um, and the Massabesic, I think, could really fill that uh, niche. Luckily, um, there's a couple of NEPA proposals, uh, a, a categorically excluded project and an environmental assessment um, that are underway that will um, allow a lot of prescribed fire and habitat management um, for research benefit in the near future. And I've listed you know, some of the opportunities here, uh, fire and soil culture for managing undesired species, uh, beech, for example, potentially some um, um, invasive species, practical methods for reducing fuels in the wildland urban interface, um, some condition-based guides to inform resource specialists. A lot of resource specialists, they may not know a lot about what a fire or prescribed fire will do to their specific resource. And we could um, work to get the information that they're looking for. Um, uh, creating habitat connectivity for threatened and endangered species uh, and impacts to threatened and endangered species. 
Um, and I am running out of time, but you can see there's just a whole host of things that we can look into on the Massabesic experimental forest. Uh, next slide, please. So just to reiterate, it's set up well to be a lab for fuels and fire research. It has a lot of good thing, a good road system, good access, good examples of our northeastern forest types. Um, and it's working already with our partner, the partners of TNC, State of Maine. Um, I think Amanda put a link into the CWPP that the Massabesic is part of. So there's just a lot of opportunities here to do some great fire and fuels based research. And that's uh, all I have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next slide, please. All right. I'd like to um, just look at some of the bird work that's been done at Massabesic and summarize some things real quick. So we're looking at three groups of habitat-driven birds. Um, the first one are the early successional birds. These are very much habitat specialists. Um, the reason why we're looking at them is the greatest declines in North America over the last 60 years has come from birds in this group. Much of the land use declines in brushy habitats really do correspond to increasing residential um, development. Um, certainly reductions in, in cut sizes have contributed to that. And most of the old field habitat has gone by, it's grown up, moved on, and there's nothing to contribute from that previously um, uh, process. So not only is early successional habitat for breeding birds important, but it's also extraordinarily important for post-fledging, pre-migrating birds um, on the landscape. So next slide, please. The second group of birds we're looking at are generalist birds. Um, these could be residents, year-long residents. They could be short distance or neotropical migrants. Um, we usually see these birds uh, using structural habitat features like cavity trees or pockets of woody understory uh, or herbaceous vegetation. And, they can, and those conditions can be found throughout all stages of stand development. So things like black and white warblers, things like uh, chickadees, turkeys, things like that, flickers and different woodpeckers. That... So next slide, please. And um, then we have the older forest birds. Uh, again, also comprised of residents, short distance and neotropical migrants. Most usually seen in uh, uh, larger poles and small saw timber stands, but these are habitats that are not at all considered old growth. Um, again, they can use a variety of structural habitat elements depending upon how the silviculture prescriptions are written. So cavity trees, trees with exfoliating bark, shrubby understories or open understories, diverse canopy foliage, um, these are all uh, habitat elements that can be found in a variety of stages of stand development. Um, so you're looking at pileated woodpeckers, you're looking at uh, things like scarlet tanagers, you're looking at black-throated blue warblers, um, oven birds, things like that, pine warblers, um, brown creepers. Can I have the next slide, please? So in the 14-year um, results on the silviculture plots, we recognize that this was a case study. It was recognized that the treatment sample sizes are, are different, but what, we've, um, what we see are treatments create variable um, amounts of habitat for early successional generalist and uh, older forest individuals, as well as species richness. The left column on the table is, on the illustration are individuals, numbers of individuals, the right-hand side is species richness, so it's a species count. So what we found was early successional species and individual were greater as seen in the patch cuts, which is the, the lower line um, in the figure. 
and generalists and older individuals and species richness were greater in the small group cuts and the shelterwood treatment. Please note that regard, please note, regardless of um, the the treatment, there were a mix of uh, generalists as well as older forest birds throughout. So next slide, please. In the um, low density thinning, we had 12 years of post-cut results. We had well over 3,600 individuals tallied on plots, flyers, and off plots over the 11 years of the surveys. Um, we had well over 3,200 individuals tallied on plots and flyovers. We had uh, double the number of individuals tallied on treated plots as opposed to control plots. Um, and what we saw were we had 19 species that were only tallied on thinned plots. That's the T in the x-axis over time. And, um, and those were early successional species or, or generalists. And four species only tallied on the control plots and those were older forest birds or generalists. So understand that uh, early successional habitat that's created through these um, treatments um, is ephemeral. And as the trees regenerate and grow, um, that limit, that brings an end to what's considered early successional habitat. Next slide, please. So to sum, sum up the low density thinning results, 50% um, of the observations in the control plots were from three species, oven birds, black cap chickadees, and hermit thrushes. 50%, that's the middle, um, uh, graph, 50% of the thin plots were from six species uh, that were tallied. Eastern towhees, prairie warblers, chestnut-sided warblers, common yellow throats, ravens, and white-throated sparrows. And when you put all the plots, all 10 plots together, five thinned and five controlled, um, seven species contributed 50% of the of the um, observations were oven birds, towhees, prairie warblers, black capped chickadees, chestnut sided warblers, ravens, and uh, common yellow throats. Um, so, with that, I want to turn it over to John Janelle to wrap this up, please. So, one of the um... The big next steps for the Mass of BSIC is uh, working on this forest restoration sale that was touched on briefly. Um, and if we end up meeting on Friday, uh, we'll take another look at this. But uh, getting into some areas that were, um, you know, affected by the fires of 47, some areas that were not affected by the fires of 47, and, uh, and putting some good forest management in there and uh, manipulating those stands, doing some prescribed fire. Um, on two of the sites, one at the admin site, one um, over on what we call the government road. Next slide. And another big project that's on the horizon for the Mass of BSIC is a, uh, as John Neely mentioned, there was an EA, environmental assessment, but it's for a um, hazardous fuel reduction project. This is something that uh, myself and John Neely started talking about um, about two or three years ago. And uh, luckily we have not had, you know, a catastrophic fire on the forest. We've had some small fires, um, but there's definitely an increase around us in Southern Maine. And we have a lot of um, just hazardous fuels issues surrounding the forest. We also have, like I mentioned early on, a lot of development that is um, on the borders of the forest, and you know we feel like we need to be good stewards and uh, and manage our sites properly. So in the event that we do have a fire, um, it's not going to affect the general public and uh, and vice versa. So a lot of good stuff can come out of this project. Um, there's going to be a lot of areas on the forest that are going to be open um, for research, especially having to do with 
prescribed fire, uh, mechanical hazardous fuels treatments, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, it's it's basically, you know, I guess you could look at as, you know, um, if you build it, they will come. And that's kind of what we're hoping here is this will kind of open that door for um, the Massabesic being that, uh, that fire research site in Southern Maine. And next slide. And that's just, uh, that's the, the previous one is the Northern unit. This is the Southern unit and it shows, uh, shows the areas that uh, we'll, be, we'll be working with and we'll have some better maps on, uh, on Friday's well. Next slide. And there's just a list of uh, current and past research that's happened on the forest. Um, I think everyone's heard of what, you know, currently is going on, but I'll just touch really briefly on the past. Uh, like I said early on, it was a white pine silviculture forest, so that was primary mission for the forest early on. Um, forest genetics, discoloration and decay, so if you took any sort of arboriculture in college and you remember um, learning about Alex Shigo, um, he did a lot of his work here on the experimental forest. Um, and uh, a lot of Blanding's turtle work has been done uh, by the University of Maine. The Massabesic, um, you know, like we said, it was all those wet areas and we're the hot spot in the state of Maine for blending spiral habitat. So there's been a tremendous amount of work done in the past there as well. And I believe that's it. Thank you, John. Thanks everybody for, for contributing to this presentation. I'm turning it back to Amanda. Fantastic, everybody. That that was really wonderful. Um, every just so you know, all speakers are about to be spotlighted. Um, so be prepared. We're going to have a little Brady Bunch thing going. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. We are going to wrap up just a bit early to focus on field trip logistics. But if you have a question for any of our speakers, please type it into the chat window. Um, boy, did you know that you were going to learn about glacial history, fire history, fire management, silviculture, bugs, birds, and other wildlife? The Massabesic Experimental Forest really has it all, and all of these elements are connected to climate change. So if you want to join the research party, contact Mariko, and if you have a question, please pop it into the chat. Jack is asking, has deer browse impeded recruitment of oak in regenerative cuts? Uh, John Janelle, do you want to take that one? To my knowledge, no, but I, don't, I haven't seen any. I don't know if Mariko has seen anything in the past. There's a little nibbling, and nibbling is is more than okay. Uh, it's when it's you know lawnmower time that that we have problems, and we have not had that as of now. Population numbers are down low enough that um, that hasn't been seen yet. Thank you both. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, Nancy has a question for Katie. Can you say more about why so many vernal pools, given that there were lots of areas on the glacial marine boundary and that are getting fine sediments, and why they're in York County versus other areas? We had, a, uh, sorry, Katie, you should be able to unmute. I apologize. We need to make you a co-host again. Okay, you should be you should be able to unmute now, Katie. Yeah, thanks for that. I had to, I got logged off and had to rejoin the call. Um, so thanks for making me co-host again. So let's see, the question was vernal pools, what's areas on the glacier marine boundary getting fine sediment. Um, my guess is that has to do with like the particular elevation. MEF is about 400 feet above sea level now. And a lot of these vernal pools in MEF are upland too. So that would be my guess. I actually haven't visited the site yet, so I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you. We'll get the spotlight back on you in a moment. All right, any other questions? I'll keep an eye on the chat. I don't get the little iPhone dot, 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 so I can't tell who's typing. Um, if any of our speakers have questions for each other, you're also welcome to ask each other questions too. I have a question for our speakers. What are you most looking forward to sharing on Friday at the field tour? Being good and wet. 
I will say, you know, mosquitoes are such an underappreciated form of wildlife in Maine um, that you guys really get ready to have your socks knocked off. They're really cool. Next to the administrative building, there is a prescribed burn unit <clears throat> that's planned for um, and that we can go out very easily and look at. Um, it also, that unit also does have a nice little vernal pool in it and it is right in the wildland urban interface. So it's got all the things that we've been talking about. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe one last question um, for Isabel. Does increasing light intensity, <clears throat> excuse me, does increasing light intensity reduce impacts of hemlock woolly adelgid and others on mature hemlock or is that just an effect on regeneration? I think it's it, it's also on the mature, but um, you know, I'm really interested in region because that's the future, and it's really hard to logistically sample mature hemlock. So, you know, that's that's why we focus on the region. But from what I understand, in when they've shown like put UV light on these insects, it's bad for them and they, you know, it, it kills them. All right, thank you. All right, and uh, Katie posted a website in the chat that folks should check out. Um, one last question I'm seeing. Um, so for Mariko, have you thought about uh, any kind of enhancement planting uh, considering climate change? Not not up till now. I know there's been some adaptation exercises in uh, northern New Hampshire and a couple other places, but um, right now um, at Bartlett, we, we haven't seen that need to, to be thinking really hard about that. We're not seeing big elevational shifts in, in um, tree species as of yet. Um, but it's always a possibility in the future, but um, we haven't done that so far. Thank you. There are two more questions snuck in related to fire. So I'll pitch it first to John Neely. Are there concerns with regards to mega fires, for example, the 1825 Miramichi fire? Yeah, so this is um, something that all folks that are engaged in fire management, fire suppression, think a lot about. And, you know, the the 49 fires, 47 fires that were <clears throat> referenced earlier, that was over 200,000 acres. Um, so a mega fire for us <clears throat> could be a lot less than, um, you know, you think about as far as like the Western, the size of the Western fires, we've got a lot, a lot of development, a lot of infrastructure. So a smaller fire in our area could cause um, <clears throat> a lot of damage uh, just because of the density of folks around here. And um, we have, you know, really what, what's been keeping us safe lately is, you know, we typically have consistent rainfall, our humidities are high, our stands are the type that resist uh, fire spread. But if that starts to subtly change, you know, we can, we can see larger fires that could become damaging. And so, you know, the hope is that we are going to get around the curve here uh, for these things that are facing us. And that does include mechanical fuel reduction and prescribed fire. And I see the second question regarding, is there a minimum acreage to make a prescribed burn feasible? No, there really isn't. It's, it's dependent on what, you, what uh, habitat you're burning in and what your goals and objectives are. Um, little small burns could be very valuable for wildlife. Um, our fire dependent ecosystems in the Northeast are dropping out. Um, there used to be a lot more of them and they're starting to disappear. And so there's a concerted effort among fire, manage, fire managers to return fire um, to these areas and um, try to support the species that, that need the habitat that fire provides. 
Thank you so much for that, John. We are a minute before the top of the hour. Please join me, everyone, in a virtual round of applause for our speakers. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom about the Massabesic Experimental Forest.